Thanks everyone for listening and thanks uh, Hemp Industry Association for hosting uh, my presentation today. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about national market trends for the hemp markets. My name's Ian Laird. I'm the CFO and general counsel of New Leaf Data Services. We have two operating divisions, Cannabis Benchmarks, which publishes a weekly report on the wholesale price of cannabis flower and trim in the 18 legal uh, US non-vertical markets in the Canadian market, and Hemp Benchmarks, which where we publish a, a monthly report on the wholesale price of hemp and hemp-derived end products and look at the drivers of prices um, supply and demand. I have a relatively traditional finance background as a lawyer, investment banker, and private equity investor. I did a, develop and finance a number of large projects that uh, had to address commodity risk in energy, mining, pulp, and paper, where we managed uh, price risk through fixed price contracts, cost plus contracts, or in some cases, hedges and derivatives. Uh, which is uh, uses uh, traditional benchmarks for uh, pulp, paper, energy, et cetera. This is our management team. Jonathan Rubin, the CEO, and I co-founded New Leaf Data Services in 2014. Our team has been together since 2015 when we started publishing our cannabis benchmarks. Significantly, uh, most of the team had worked together uh, previously at uh, S&P Global Platts. Uh, which is a leading price reporting agency for energy and other commodities. Uh, we are an independent price reporting agency. Our team has 130 plus years of commodity data services experience and 50 plus years of cannabis and hemp experience. Again, the majority of our team comes from uh, Platts and other price reporting agencies. So we have a deep background in uh, benchmarking and price reporting. We found a new leaf data in 2014 to bring transparency to the wholesale cannabis markets to allow businesses and markets to operate more efficiently. Uh, we expanded into hemp in 2016, 2018, that time period. Uh, although we didn't start publishing our hemp benchmarks report until April of 2019. We collect data from a number of sources in the field price contributors uh, a price report, excuse me, price contributor network, which is made up of producers, processors, and purchasers. And we have partnerships with brokers, exchanges, vendors, and associations who also supply us with our wholesale pricing data. Our price assessments use the same methodology as the leading price reporting agencies, such as Platts and Argus Media. And we do not have a physical or financial exposure to the commodities that we assess, so we're truly independent. Pricing trends. Oh. We don't want to, this is something we all live through, so we won't spend a lot of time with it. But what we saw from April of 2019 when we started publishing our price assessments to June of this year was dramatic compression across most of the categories that we report on. Uh, CBD dot biomass down 84%. Uh, crude oil down 95%, distillate 78%, CBD isolate down 85%, CBD flowers were relatively resilient, down 50%, and industrial seeds were actually up. Wholesale price trends from June year over year, we saw that prices remained relatively stable through the first half of the growing season and then began to deteriorate rapidly as the market became overwhelmed by the increased supply of biomass and, uh, and extracted products. Uh, prices have begun to stabilize uh, at relatively low levels uh, uh, starting in April and coming into this season, this growing season. This is relatively, uh, this shows the price compression uh, pretty dramatically uh, with prices uh, deteriorating dramatically from October through March and then stabilizing uh, somewhat as uh, people burned off uh, some inventory 
a lot of biomass still sitting in barns, uh, but people are getting ready for the 2020 harvest season coming up in a month or two now. As everyone in economics uh, 101 knows, uh, prices are driven by supply and demand. And we can see in the permitted acreage from 2019, Two thousand and nineteen permitted acreage saw a significant increase in permitted acreage across the country from two thousand eighteen. Uh, this was really the green rush as uh, farmers uh, who saw prices uh, forty fifty sixty thousand dollars an acre in two thousand and eighteen rushed to get permitted in two thousand and nineteen with over five hundred and seventy thousand permitted acres. Uh, based on reports from state departments of agriculture and from farmers in the field, uh, we think that less than 40% of the acres were actually planted, uh, but still significantly more than 2018, almost four times as much. And of the 270,000 planted acres, uh, our uh, analysis showed roughly 100,000 acres actually uh, harvested uh, with processable biomass. Um, impact uh, due to Genetic issues, uh, weather, uh, dry, hot summer, wet fall during the harvest, uh, and pests. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, hemp uh, is, uh, while it is called a weed, it uh, does present issues for farmers uh, who are unfamiliar with uh, planting hemp in 2019. Uh, 2020, we've seen a 30% reduction in the permitted acres. Uh, there are more states with uh, hemp approved plans, but there are major reductions in some of the more established mature hemp markets like Colorado, Kentucky, uh, North Carolina, and Oregon. So this year, roughly 400,000 acres permitted. Uh, from what we hear in the field, uh, we think even less, uh, a lower percentage will actually be planted or actually has been planted this year. And uh, again, we're seeing some impacts from uh, some severe weather across the country, uh, extreme heat in many states, uh, drought in places, uh, some early hurricane uh, damage in some of the southeastern states, and there are um, a lot of uh, weather events still uh, predicted. Uh, we had the Direco in the Midwest, and it uh, looks like it's going to be an active hurricane season. So we do expect uh, that the harvested acreage will fall uh, by 30 percent or so from um, last year. Uh, but still a significant supply of biomass uh, for the 2020 season. Uh, last year's crop uh, presented numerous challenges for many farmers. Um, again, an unfamiliar crop uh, and uh, farmers um, had to work hard to get their harvest in, uh, bucked and dried. Uh, based on the early price expectations from 2018, Farmers expected to make a profit, but it was clearly tough, uh, tough going for many farmers, uh, with some states reporting that at least 30% of the farmers actually lost money in the field. When we started looking at uh, issues uh, last season, we were looking at bottlenecks and drying, and harvesting, and extraction, uh, but it, uh, clearly uh, extraction is not a bottleneck issue. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, uh, no one had built a database of installed capacity, extraction capacity across the country. Uh, so we set about uh, last fall and through the spring, uh, compiling a list of 150 extractors and talking to perhaps 100 of them to get their capacity data. We published this heat map in April of 2020. Uh, which shows just out of that uh, subset of 100 plus uh, extractors, which shows significant extraction capacity in the more mature markets as expected, Oregon, Colorado, California, and in the Southeast with South Carolina, North Carolina, Kentucky, and Tennessee having uh, quite a bit of uh, extraction capacity. We continue to build our database uh, through a survey uh, that we conducted in uh, May, June, uh, where we got uh, data from roughly 
300 additional processors. So we have almost 400 processors in our database right now. Uh, what's significant uh, here is that although the daily input input capacities were relatively evenly distributed. The uh, larger uh, set, 15% uh, of the uh, processors could process more than 5,000 pounds of biomass a day. Uh, that's roughly 45 processors um, capable of processing over 75 million pounds of biomass, uh, which is uh, significantly more than the market requires. And that's just from a subset of 45 extractors. More than 70% of the uh, processors in the survey uh, processed uh, crude oil into full and, or broad spectrum distillate. And if you look at the uh, lower chart, uh, the last three columns, that's more than 25% of the respondents uh, produced, that's produced distillate at scale. Uh, those 25 respondents, if you kind of take a midpoint of their production capacity, have the ability to process uh, over 4 million kilos of full spectrum or broad spectrum distillate, which again is significantly more than the market would require. And that's just from a subset here for roughly 75 extractors. So clearly uh, extraction capacity was not an issue. It should not be an issue uh, in the near term. Uh, we have seen significant financial dislocation with some of the larger uh, extractors that uh, expanded uh, rapidly uh, and uh, hundreds of millions of dollars probably of uh, uh, losses uh, in investment uh, in some of the larger facilities. Last on the survey was THC remediation. And what's uh, I thought surprising here was more than 40% of the uh, respondents actually uh, could remediate THC, which has become a uh, with broad spectrum and, and THC free a, a larger category. Of course, the critical question is demand for the CBD. Uh, CBD demand uh, is uh, very opaque. It's very difficult to get data. A lot of channels don't report. Uh, sales are spread across many channels. Uh, estimates of the US CBD market size for 2019 varied widely uh, from 813,000 from Statista uh, to over to 5 billion by the Brightfield Group. Uh, Forbes actually threw in a $13 billion number without a source. Uh, similarly, early forecast for 2020 had a big spread from 1.15 up to 10 billion. Uh, Brightfield Group has since cut their, uh, their projection to 4.7 billion. Uh, and Nielsen's probably revising theirs down as is BDS analytics. But longer term, uh, we're still forecasting extraordinary growth of up to 22 billion from Brightfield Group, 16 billion from Cowan in 2025. Uh, one uh, uh, metric that I've looked at is uh, if you assume the 10% of the adult population in the U.S. Uh, use CBD as a supplement um, or a nutraceutical, uh, the average, that's about 25 uh, million people, average spend for dietary supplements is about four to 500 bucks a person. Uh, so that could be a $12.5 billion market as we begin to get penetration. The impediments to growth in the uh, cannabinoid market are uh, clearly FDA regulations. That's uh, probably the most significant issue. Um, expanded distribution channels to make access uh, more, uh, provide easier access. Uh, clearly uh, COVID's impacted uh, brick and mortar sales uh, since it was not deemed an essential business, uh, but that to some degree was made up by online sales with uh, some of the CBD companies that have a good online presence like Charlotte's Web. Uh, some of the larger 
uh, CBD uh, companies like CB Sciences without uh, robust online uh, platforms have seen uh, dramatic uh, decreases in CBD sales with second quarter sales of CB Sciences down 68% from 16.9 to 5.4 million. Uh, quality control and quality assurance is still an issue. Research and education is difficult uh, without the brick and mortar stores. Um, and also uh, prices are quite high uh, in today's environment. We expect to see lower retail prices uh, reflecting a dramatic decrease in the price of, uh, to produce uh, distillates and, uh, and uh, isolates. Uh, our forecast for 2020 is limited growth, market size of $1.5 to $2 billion. Uh, so clearly the market is still significantly oversupplied uh, for this year. So we expect some price stabilization, some continued consolidation. Uh, but long term, we see significant uh, growth opportunities uh, with have, having the potential to disrupt trillion dollar global markets, uh, particularly for fiber and grain, which we think uh, in three to five years will be uh, far larger than the uh, CBD and cannabinoid market. Um, textiles alone are a trillion dollar market. We're seeing uh, movement there with uh, cottonized uh, hemp, um, uh, ready mix concrete and building products, ethanol and biofuels. There's been some very interesting studies recently on uh, hemp uh, as a uh, significant uh, replacement for uh, ethanol and, and other biofuels. Obviously, nutraceuticals and dietary supplements is a strong market. Nonwoven fibers, we're already beginning to see uh, some developments, medium density fiber boards, some uh, major equipment manufacturers actually are uh, producing uh, uh, treatment, pre-treatment and refiners for medium density fiber board uh, using hemp instead of uh, wood chips and of course cellulose fiber for pulp. Uh, so uh, longer term, uh, we think that um, traditional industrial hemp uh, will displace uh, some traditional markets via a, a bio uh, a replacement for bioplastics and if uh, industrial hemp disrupts just to 5, 10 to 10 percent of these uh, limited markets, doesn't even include grain, uh, the market size could range from 150 to 250 billion. So in the short term, we see some continued uh, consolidation, some stabilization, some rationalization. Uh, we're going to be seeing uh, continue to see more fiber and grain uh, versus CBD. Uh, but uh, at this point, um, the market is clearly well supplied uh, with the biomass that's being produced on hand. Uh, thanks so much. I uh, wish I could take your questions and answers. Everyone stay safe and uh, see you on the other side. Take care.